Um, so we are a coalition of labor groups and um, community members that uh, grew out of Jobs with Justice, which is a labor and community partnership here. And uh, we came together to form the coalition because of an H-2A farm worker, Ernesto, who died, and the other farm workers who suffered severe mistreatment from the corporate Sarbandon farm. That loss triggered concerns for the whole food system and its sustainability. Tonight, we are talking about sustainable farming and food system. Each panelist will share their perspective and uh, we can look at some of the critical elements of sustainable farming and food systems. How they remain economically viable, providing living wage for workers throughout the food system, provide safe working conditions and protection for the environment. Uh, Ramon Torres. Uh, he, Ramon is the president of Familia Junidas por la Justica, a farm worker union. He, is, he has led the fight for fair wages and conditions for farm workers, and he negotiated the first farm worker contract, union contract that's in the farms. Wayne Landis. <laughs> Wayne Landis is the director of the Institute of Environmental Tox uh, Toxicology at Western Washington University. He has research centers on the uh, ecological uh, risk assessment of chemicals, invasive species, and other factors. Funding for this research has been brought from industry to federal agencies, state agencies such as the Puget Sound Partnership. He's a fellow of the Society for Risk Analysis and the Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. And Ann Russell is the manager for Clean Water and North Sound Baykeeper Program. She has been with resources working on water quality and quality and quantity for three years and has been involved in conservation and land use for over 15 years. Resources promote sustainable communities and protects the health of Northwest Washington people and the environment. The Clean Water and North Sound Bay Baykeeper team envisions a future of clean streams healthy shores, abundant water for farms, fish, and people, protected through actively educating and engaging the communities in Northwest Washington. And uh, Harley Soltis. And so Harley and his wife Susan have spent seven years revitalizing the oldest blueberry farm in the Skagit Valley to create a sustainable family farm through conversion to organic production of value-added products. Uh, at six acres, uh, Boho Blueberries is a relatively small farm when compared to today's uh, blueberry and raspberry operations in Northwest Washington. And Adrian Renz is the outreach manager for the Community Food Co-op, where she works to define values and goals for the co-op while putting them into practice. The co-op is a community-owned uh, cooperative grocery store committed to food system development that strengthens our community assets and people. In working towards food system development, she has served in the development and leadership of the Whatcom Food Network to build collaboration and, out, uh, and understanding between stakeholders on the issues and opportunities uh, presented to us today. So we'll get started. Um, each panelist will give a short presentation, um, then both of us will ask a question each. Um, then we'll turn the questions over to you, the audience. Um, Michelle will be going around with a microphone, so if you have a question you'd like to ask, just raise your hand and we'll point to you and she'll come to you with the microphone. And you also have um, index cards and a pencil on your seat. So if you would prefer to write out your question, um, you can do that and just pass it forward. <coughs> Um, if there are questions that we don't get to, uh, we will collect all of the questions at the end and answer some of them on the Facebook page. All right, um, let's get started. I think Ramon wants first. Bueno, um, primeramente, este, queríamos uh, anunciar que queríamos hacer la oración del campesino. So first, I wanted to announce that we were going to do the farmer group prayer. Uh, in memoria de nuestro compañero que falleció este esta temporada. In honor of our 
farm worker that died this last season. Los personas que puedan pararse, si por favor se paran. So those who can stand, uh, please do. Uh, vamos a repetir uh, después. Yo, lo, como se trata es de que yo digo una oración, va a ser en español, y los que puedan repetirla, la repiten después. So I'm going to uh, say it in Spanish, uh, and the way that it works is I say a line and then everybody repeats it. Uh, enséñame el sufrimiento de los más desafortunados. Enséñame el sufrimiento de los más desafortunados. Así conoceré el dolor de mi pueblo. Así conoceré el dolor de mi pueblo. Líbrame a orar por los demás. Líbrame a orar por los demás. Porque estás presente en cada persona. Porque estás presente en cada persona. Ayúdame a tomar responsabilidad de mi propia vida. Ayúdame a tomar responsabilidad de mi propia vida. Solo así seré libre al fin. Solo así seré libre al fin. Concédeme valentía para servir al prójimo. Concédeme valentía para servir al prójimo. Porque en la entrega hay vida verdadera. Porque en la vida hay vida verdadera. Concédeme honradez y paciencia. Para que yo pueda trabajar junto con otros trabajadores. Para que yo pueda trabajar junto con otros trabajadores. Alúmbranos con el canto y la celebración. Para que levanten el espíritu entre nosotros. Para que levanten el espíritu entre nosotros. El espíritu florezca y crezca. Que el espíritu florezca y crezca. Para que no nos cansemos entre la lucha. Para que no nos cansemos entre la lucha. Nos acordamos de los que han caído por la justicia. Nos acordamos de porque a nosotros han entregado la vida. Porque a nosotros han entregado la vida. Ayúdanos a amar a uno a los que nos odian. Ayúdanos a amar a uno a los que nos odian. Así podremos cambiar el mundo. Así podemos cambiar el mundo. Fue escrito por César Chávez. So that was written by César Chávez. Gracias. So thank you. Bueno, buenas tardes. So, good afternoon. Uh, bueno, me gustaría empezar con los logros que logró el sindicato en el 2017. I would like to start off with the achievement that the union was able to gain in 2017. Con el primer contrato de unión. With the first union contract. Pero a la misma vez tuvimos una persona que falleció. Uh, we had these wins, but we also had somebody that died. Entonces tuvimos logros. So we were able to achieve things. Y a la misma vez fue algo muy triste. And at the same time was something that was sad. Para continuar otra pelea. Uh, to continue another fight. Entonces ahorita, lamentablemente, gracias al compañero que falleció. So because of the person that passed away. Vamos a empezar otro movimiento. We're going to start a, a new movement. En lo que se enfoca la unión. Uh, one that the union is going to be focused on. O lo que nos decidimos enfocar los trabajadores de campo. This is what farm workers are going to be focusing on. Esta es una buena lección para nosotros aprender. So, and this is a good uh, lesson for all of us to learn. De que no somos herramienta. That we're not just machinery or tools. Que necesitamos contratos de unión. That we need union contracts. Necesitamos protecciones. We need protections. Necesitamos beneficios. And benefits. No estamos de acuerdo con traer contratistas como Wafla. We don't agree with labor contractors like Wafla. Estos contratistas están viendo nuestra gente como herramientas. These contractors are thinking that we're just tools. Nuestra gente no es herramienta. Our people are not just tools. Entonces no podemos estar permitiendo que nuestra gente esté muriendo en los campos. And we can't be allowing that our people be dying in the fields. Y la única solución es contratos de unión. The only solution is union contracts. En la que nosotros podamos proteger nuestra propia gente. Where we ourselves can protect our people. Que podamos decidir qué es lo que ocupamos en nuestro lugar de trabajo. Where we can decide what do we need in our jobs. Qué es lo que ocupamos, planes médicos. What do we need? Uh, benefits. benefits. What's the most urgent? Está our people are dying. Y la comunidad, somos los únicos que podemos hacer algo. And our community, we're the only ones that can do anything. Somos los únicos que tenemos la decisión de proteger a nuestros trabajadores de campo. We're the ones that can decide whether or not we protect farm workers. La única forma que nuestros trabajadores tengan beneficios es bajo nuestro contrato de unión. So the only way they can protect these gains is through union contracts. ¿Por qué contratos de unión? And why contracts? Es la única forma que trabajadores de campo seamos protegidos. It's the only way that we are able to be protected. No somos protegidos bajo la ley laboral. We're not protected under labor law. Entonces, la única consideración es un contrato de unión. The only way we can uh, get protection is a union contract. Que garantice lo básico para nosotros. That guarantees the basic things. En lo básico estamos hablando de sueldos justos. 
The basics include a just wage, condiciones buenas de trabajo, good working conditions, condiciones buenas de vivienda, good housing conditions. Estamos hablando de trabajadores que vienen de otro país. We're talking about workers that come from another country. Hacer trabajo de esclavos, to do work of slaves. Trabajo que no quieren lidiar con trabajadores domésticos. Workers that they don't want to hire local people. Porque nosotros ya estamos listos, estamos preparados para pelear. We're we're ready and willing to do the work and to fight. Ya no estamos dispuestos a estar perdiendo. We don't want to be uh, open to lose anymore. Que nos estén robando. That we'll uh, to get our wages stolen. Ahorita nuestro gran propósito es hacer otros caminos. Our purpose is to create new paths. Que nuestros trabajadores de campo decidan qué quieren hacer. So farm workers can decide what they want to do. Incluyendo con lo que pasó este año trabajadores H2A. Including H2A workers. Estos trabajadores no tienen la culpa de venir contratados. The H2A workers, it's not their fault that they were brought under uh, contractors. Los contratistas son los que están haciendo todo el trabajo. The labor contractors are at fault. No sé si vieron hoy, hoy se anunció la primera demanda colectiva. If you saw today, today there was a lawsuit uh, that was filed. Tráfico humano. For human trafficking. Están traficando a nuestra gente. They're trafficking our people. Eso tiene que parar. And that has to end. Estamos dispuestos a hacer todo lo que nos cueste como un sindicato and para cambiar. We're willing to do everything uh, within our power as a union. No es que estemos a contra de las de las granjas. We're not against farms. Sabemos de muchas granjas que están haciendo lo correcto. We know a lot of farms that are doing the right Pero thing. Pero el sindicato quiere asegurar que se haga al 100%. But the union wants to make sure everything is done correctly, 100%. No, no podemos perder más trabajadores. We can't lose more workers. Estamos al 100% seguros y conscientes. We're 100% sure and we're very conscious. Sin, gra sin granjas. With no farms. No hay trabajadores. There is no workers. Y sin trabajadores no hay granjas. And without workers, there is no farms. Entonces lo que estamos tratando de hacer es de que algunos rancheros entiendan nuestra posición. So what we're trying to do is, uh, hopefully uh, farmers will listen to our position. No hay otra forma en la que nosotros podamos hacer valer nuestros derechos. There's no other way for us to make our rights uh, sí. heard. Without union el único que nos garantiza un mejor futuro. That's the only thing that guarantees us a, be a better future. Y no es que no queramos ser trabajadores de campo. It's not that we don't want to just be farm workers. Sí queremos. We do. Pero queremos una oportunidad para nuestro futuro. But we want opportunities for our future. Entonces aquí es donde incluimos a nuestros hermanos trabajadores H2A. This is where our brothers and sisters under H2A are included. No queremos pelear con ellos, we don't want to fight with them, pero queremos especialmente que a nuestra gente o trabajadores locales, but we want the people that are here, our local workers, se les dé prioridad, to get priority. Y después si ocupamos gente, puede traer trabajadores. And then if we do really need workers, we can then bring in workers. Siempre y cuando lleguemos en acuerdos con contratos colectivos. Only when it's all guaranteed under union contract. Trabajando con el sindicato. Working with the union. Muchas gracias. So thank you. Oh, sure. I'll tell you too. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. There's a, a school in town. I work for it. Western Washington University. I've been there since 1989, which my hair looked a lot different back then. I see that some of the rest of us are also working on that longevity thing. Um, so I've been there a long time. Um, I'm direct institute of environmental toxicology and, chemist, uh, and used to be chemistry at Western. Uh, my job is to, our mission is basically to be a service, uh, to provide uh, an education and also do research. So because of that, um, that's how we're fun I've been funded by so many different kinds of organizations from industry, NGOs. Uh, all kinds of agencies from different states and provinces uh, because it's so easy to do here. I could be a president because I can see Canada from my building, right? Okay. <laughs> and also, uh, it's kind of fun. We work a lot with the Peterstown Partnership. Also, we help for, we've helped organize the Sailor City Ecosystem Conference, which is about this entire region, uh, including farm workers, uh, all kinds of communities, uh, First Nations tribes. Uh, so the Sailor Sea uh, organization does a lot of that. Western now has the Sailor Sea Institute. 
Um, and I used to work at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Anyone here in the military? Have you ever been in the military? Yes, Aberdeen Proving Ground. You may have heard of it. I worked at the Edgewood area. That, yes, that's where chemical weapons were. What? That's where they made dessert nerve gas. What? That's where they made dessert nerve gas. So we actually did make it. But when I was there, because after six to nine, you weren't supposed to do that. Uh, we did all the gas masks, all the, all the equipment. If we actually needed something like nerve gas, we'd make it ourselves. So yeah, and you're going, how is this relevant to what we're talking about? <laughs> the nerve agent used for chemical warfare and the pesticides are often used for all the same chemical class. So that's, I've had a long interest in what we call organic phosphates and related kinds of compounds. So we're gonna kind of talk about that. That's how I know a little bit about the human toxicology that's involved. Most of my emphasis is on non-humans. And you're going, why should I care about those? Because uh, you eat them. You hunt them, fish them. And uh, it's the environment that provides ecosystem services. That's why you have farms here. And uh, lots of ecotourism and so forth. So we're going to touch about, we're going to touch on all that. Uh, my website's right there. But the easiest thing to do if you want to know more about me is just Google it, which is so convenient. Uh, just Google Wayne Landis Toxicology and then just start reading. Thank God for Google. Um, and you also wonder, well, you're kind of like a scientist, a professor, what do you know? And um, what's your point of view? And it's actually, uh, I describe this all the time all over the world. So I'm a scientist. I don't make policy decisions. I inform people. And what I try to do, that information has to be backed up by evidence. I just can't stand up in front of you and say, I believe, because it makes me feel good. It doesn't work that way. You're supposed to have evidence about what occurs. <coughs> Unfortunately, in some areas of what we're going to talk about tonight, there's lots of evidence, scientific information, and others not so much. I think that's what frustrates many people in the public. Well, you're a scientist. You should know everything. So no one knows everything. What do you mean? You don't know everything? No. What I spend my life doing is living on that edge if we already know it, it's of no interest to me, because I can look it up. So we're always trying to find out what we don't know. And when it comes to ecosystem services and all these interactions, there's a lot we don't know. You know, well, what side do you advocate for? I work for the state of Washington. The state of Washington, I'm a civil servant, which I don't think everyone understands that. And so by rule, I have no side. I, and when you advocate for, Wayne, the science, and lately, a lot of my papers have been about advocating for the science, given the current state of affairs in the United States. Uh, actually, in Europe as well. So it's not just the United States, but also Canada and Australia have seen some of the same kinds of things happening with a lack of support of science. Um, so we're not decision makers, but if you ask me a question, I will answer it. And there will be times that I'll just say, I don't know. In some cases, I'll say, we don't know. When I mean we, we not my laboratory group, but us as, as a group of scientists in toxicology. I thought I'd bring this along. I hope you guys recognize these watersheds. You guys talk about counties. I'm glad we got someone here from Skagit. I think about watersheds, because that's the natural boundary. And these are just maps of two of the very cool ones that we have. The one on your left is the Nooksack. Great watershed. It's also an enormously diverse <laughs> watershed, right? Because you go up there from forest land, these beautiful forests, and you're thinking, oh, this is really natural and great, until you see the other side of the hill, it's all been cut. Just saying. We also have great rivers, the different parts of the Nooksack, and we're come together. And of course, once it hits the flatlands, going through linen and so forth, it's beautiful, beautiful land. And you'll see some pictures of that in just a minute. Then we have the Skagit. What a great river as well. Huge runs of salmonids and eagles that like to eat them. And this is the eagle season, right? This is where you get to go up and, and see that. Um, also, lots of water. Uh, in the summertime now, the biggest change I've seen is the water coming into the Skagit has that blue color you get from the glacier melt. That's a different thing than what happened when I first got here in 1989. So we're seeing some of those changes. Uh, so there's a lot going on here. There's also this area provides lots of what we call ecosystem services, things that you derive from that area. Um, crops, we have a huge variety of crops here. They're very seasonal. A uh, wide variety of fisheries. Uh, fresh water, people really do like to fish trout. 
And you're going, that's not a commercial fishery. Um, the guy who goes fly fishing, I don't know where he bought his stuff from, and I don't know what hotel he stayed in. Oh, it was in Watkins County, or Skagit County. Um, forests, lots of forests, and we also have huge numbers of protected areas. So this is an enormously valued part of the state of Washington. This is kind of cool. So I'm a pilot. So I recognize this part of the, I recognize this county better from here sometimes than I do driving around in it. Of course, that's part of the Nooksack. You can see Mount Baker there in the background. Um, the winding kind of curvaceous uh, rivers we have, where the flows really down. And I took this in the summer. We had almost no water flow that summer, right? So this is kind of, kind of cool. You know, isn't it, isn't it really hard to fly the airplane and take, camera, take pictures? I have an iPhone. I've been flying a long time. The airplane really knows how to fly. I'm just there to kind of guide it along. And this just kind of shows the diversity. And we have the rivers and the watersheds are really bounded by the agricultural lands. And you can see in the upper left-hand side that really there's not much boundary there. In some places there are. There's lots of different kinds of agriculture and so forth that occurs. In the upper right, you can see some more of the land and we're looking out towards London and Canada. Down at the lower left, uh, it's not agricultural, but certainly is a huge employer. This is the areas at Cherry Point. There's agriculture that goes on out there. There's wildlife preserves. Uh, shipping comes in, tankers, and so on. So there's a lot that goes on in that particular area. It's a real mixture. It's also where you see the freshwater and the marine systems interact hugely. Uh, also in Lake Terrell, there's actually salmon runs that come in up through there. And of course, in your lower right, um, Bellingham. What was it? We have about 150,000 people in the county. About 100,000 of them live around Bellingham. So huge, huge part of the system. Um, that's where I work, and you can see Lake Wacom right up there. Wait, well, Lake Wacom has agriculture, timber use, all these other kinds of things going on. And you can just start listing off all the kinds of ecosystem services that are used there. And they're used by multiple communities. They're used by um, farm workers. Uh, first, uh, native uh, people, indigenous people, uh, people who have been here, I love it when people say, I've been in Bellingham like five generations. I'm thinking back how long that's got to be. I'm from the East Coast, so that means you're just warming up, right? But for Bellingham, it's a long time. Uh, and then we used to have a pulp and paper mill. That was a huge employer when I first got here. I played on their uh, basketball team, one of their basketball teams. So uh, when they went away, we lost our sponsorship. Um, the thing is that there's a wide variety of pesticides that are used um, and lots of different kinds of uses of pesticides and pesticides are used quite a bit uh, for lots of different reasons. Some farmers actually are uh, organic, they, they don't use them and there's just this thing called sustainability. I do not know what you mean by sustainability. Why is that Wayne? I'll talk a little bit later because everyone has a different way of using the word. So I have to sit down and ask 20 questions. Please, tell me what you think sustainability is. And I start going through my list of questions. And then I can go through and actually see what kinds of ecosystem services that you're actually thinking about. We'll talk a little about that in a minute. Okay, I'm a toxicologist, chemical structures, and a little bit of biology, just for fun. And you're going, you would have fun doing this. I, I can't help it. Organophosphates. There, there are two kinds of things, chemicals that are used that uh, inhibit this enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. If it's inhibited, your central nervous system doesn't work very well. And you know about chemical weapons? That's what kills you. It's not, it's not that it's hurting your lungs and stuff. What it is, in order to breathe, you hit, your diaphragm has to function. If your nervous system isn't functioning, you, your diaphragm's not functioning. Also, these kinds of chemicals, because they interact with this enzyme, also cause um, higher brain functions to go away. And lots of different things occur. The kinds of pesticides that this group includes, includes things like diazinon, malathion, uh, corpyrifos, uh, and a variety of carbamates. And they all work on this particular enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. The thing is, the toxicity of all this depends upon the chemical and also the receptor. And, and, and you guys are the receptors, right? There's a ground of phosphate in the air or on your skin. You're the receptor. And you're going, oh, so we're all human. Now, I know that's how you think of yourselves, 
But as a, when you think about human toxicology, we're an enormously diverse group of organisms. And what happens and what makes it so hard to determine what's safe is that there are actually people who have enzymes in them that break down these chemicals. Break them down before you can see the effect <coughs> at some concentrations. Some people don't have these enzymes and they're very sensitive to it. Sensitivity also depends upon age, uh, reproductive status, uh, surface to volume ratio. It's, sometimes it's okay to be a few pounds overweight because you're absorbing it, but it gets diluted out by that other mass. So there are a lot of things that take, us, to take this into account. I know, I know, and everyone's going, thank God. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I had a good friend of mine, she's like 5'1 and skinny. She goes, Wayne, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Another time, this is a toxicology joke. It was, it was funnier at the conference. Yeah. Um, and this is what happens it, the, when the nerves come together and the axon, this chemical uh, acetylcholine is actually is what makes the connection between the one nerve firing and the next one. If that chemical isn't broken down, the other nerve keeps firing. And boy, do you lack coordination. <laughs> uh, and other things start to happen. That's what happens in your motor control. It also happens in your mind, because it also inhibits some of those neurotransmitters there. And um, ducks expose these kinds of chemicals that were broody, that were having a nest, they'll forget they had a nest. They won't go back and take care of it. So you have a wide range of effects that occur. And it's like the bell curve. Some people are very resistant. Some people are very sensitive. It's very difficult to incorporate all that, especially people with lots of different backgrounds and lots of different exposures. It's also important when you're exposed. If you had an exposure to this chemical two days ago, you probably were okay. But if you had that exposure two days ago and you were exposed today, you're actually much more sensitive to it uh, because um, the chemical still binds to your proteins and so forth, but the proteins that aren't this enzyme, it just sticks to them. But it takes some of it away. The thing is, we're exposed, we're only exposed today. Those proteins are already kind of sequestered away and kept it away from my nerve endings. Well, those are already taken up, so I get a larger exposure. So it's enormously important to think about just not about the total dose that you got today, but what's happened in the past. Also, what's your nutritional status? You know, are you really healthy? Are you sick? All these kinds of things play a role in how sensitive you are to that particular chemical. And that's why it's so hard sometimes to make a prediction about how toxic something's going to be. The other thing that happens is that we have a source of the chemical, um, you get exposed to it, the sensitivity varies, and then you see toxicity. So all these variables can be changed. Uh, also, some of these organophosphates, like one of them called malathion, so we call a synergist to other chemicals, to other organophosphates. Malathion makes the others more strong, stronger. That's called synergism. And then we know that for organophosphates. Um, and also a lot of sources. So you go, oh, I'm exposed on the farm. Go into Fred Meyer, read the label. So a lot of these chemicals exist in people's lawns and are used for a variety of reasons, and they don't always read the label. Uh, what's the exposure, what's the chemical, ex um, what's the organism exposed to? Well, if you're a fish, everything. All the agriculture runoff, uh, some of the pesticides, so forth and so on. So none of us are exposed to ever to one chemical, but we're exposed to a mixture. And one of the biggest problems, issues in my science right now, we don't ex understand how these mixtures interact and how they interact on a molecular level. The nice thing about humans, we're one species. Now, how many species of uh, some monads are there in the rivers here? Five, at least? Okay. Um, sustainability. And I was asked to talk a little bit about sustainability, and I said, I don't know. So I tie it back to what I can do as a science scientist. People when they usually talk about sustainability. They're talking about maintaining those services that environment provides, that maintains their way of life, maintains the things that are value to them. And it varies tremendously depending on what country you're in or what county you're in. Somehow I think King County is probably thinking about this different than Whatcom County. How many berry farms are there in King County? 
It's a little different way of looking at it. These services include all kinds of things, clean water, air, economic development. What does that have to do with the ecosystem? The water. Western, it's actually how we recruit people. We can get new faculty, because we bring them to Bellingham and say, you get to raise, you get to live here and raise your kids. They look at the environment and so forth. It's a huge recruitment tool for us, which has a huge economic impact in this area. Treaty rights, treaty rights, treaty rights. It's like contracts. They have, there are, with the tribes, there are certain rights they have by negotiated treaty with the United States government. That's a huge you know, ecosystem service. Wild fish, shellfish, birds, just keep going on. Oh, I have to put in fungi. No one ever talks about fungi. I, I think they're great. And also, how long? How long? Was it the oldest blueberry farm is what, not quite 100 years old? Is that what I was hearing? Yeah, how, how many people here plan for 100 years from now? From now, from now, how many years from now? They plant some trees. Okay, we do plant trees, and some civil culture does think about multi-hundred year um, time frames, but most of us don't, absolutely. So what time frame are you actually thinking about? Is it seven generations into the future, as uh, many tribes and First Nations like to talk about? Is it uh, 20 years or until you retire? And now I'm moving away. It's really hard to get that from people. Um, and we have a political system that works on two and four year cycles. So that planning's really hard. Mathematically, I don't believe anything after 50 years. When I'm doing the math, either the climate change or the fish populations that I do, after about 50 years, our lack of knowledge blows up the model. So I can tell you climate change will occur, but don't ask me to be very precise very far into the future. And you're going, that sounds really bad. The weather is only good for five to 10 days. So I don't feel quite so bad about it. Sustainability, things you can count on that will occur in the next 50 years. Uh, if I tell you the population of Whatcom County is going to increase, does that surprise anybody? No. You know, this area within what we call the Salish Sea, uh, the Puget Sound, and Georgia Straits, I think they're expecting 5 million additional people in that time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the climate is changing. There are clear drivers where the climate here is going to become more like California <laughs> and in some ways. And it's not that the total amount of precipitation is going to change, but it's probably going to be more of its water instead of snow. You know, that's okay with me. Not if you don't have reservoirs. We don't build reservoirs here. We have lakes and we have snow. So those kinds of things will certainly occur. And what's going to happen here? That's a bald eagle. That's Cherry Point. Uh, that's a tanker. Which one of those things, and how are they going to change? That's really a great question. Sea level, we know, is going to rise. What's the oil, what's the energy going to business going to be like 50 years from now? Are we going to be past the oil? Uh, are people still going to be harvesting Cherry Point for shellfish? Probably. And I can tell you, people are still going to want to come here and see the eagles. So that, I guess that's how I think about the sustainability. How long will pesticides be here? Boy, ever since they started making them, they still make them. So we're, it's gonna be really interesting to see how that occurs. Thank you very much. probably have a lot of questions or so I won't I won't talk too long but um, my name is Ann Russell and I'm the program manager for the clean water program and the North Sound Bay keeper program at resources for sustainable communities um, raise your hand if you've heard of resources okay great then I won't talk too much about the organization uh, but we do have kind of four areas where we work clean energy Eddie Urie's here our clean energy program manager 
uh, clean water uh, and sustainable schools, which is a program that does environmental ed in schools throughout the county, and uh, we run the Restore, which is what most people know. So I manage clean water, and uh, I think Wayne did a pretty good job at talking to you about some of the challenges and some of the issues that we have with our water here in Whatcom County. Uh, there's probably two, what I would say, main sources of pollution uh, getting into our water, and they are uh, polluted urban runoff or stormwater. So that's everything that runs off of our houses, runs off of our yards, our cars, uh, our streets, all of that into our storm drains, and, and most of that goes directly into waterways. So storm water is not treated. It doesn't go to a water treatment facility and, and get cleaned up. It usually ends up either out in uh, one of the bays or one of the marine near shore waters or uh, in our streams or uh, sometimes in groundwater too. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Anything that's running off of our bodies, whether our bodies are in the fields or uh, outside in any way, that's all going into our water. So. And we're all made of a lot of water as well. So, uh, and then you know, the other thing we work on is water quantity. So, how much water we have here? How do we allocate it? Who has the right to access it? And what do they have the right to access it for? Um, we have a system in the West of water rights that's called prior appropriation. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about this because it, it's it's really important. Um, in how agriculture plays out in our county and in Skagit County as well. The first, it's called first in time, first in right. So you're basically in a line. Um, and the most senior water rights holders in Whatcom County and Skagit County as well are Native American tribes. Uh, here in Whatcom County, that's the Lummi Nation and the Nooksack Indian tribe. And, you know, Wayne may, mentioned treaty rights. Um, and one thing, that I find interesting about treaty rights, and there might be folks in this room that know a lot more about treaty rights than I do. Um, incidentally, we, right now we're all on land that was uh, part of the Lummi Nation, and uh, we are here by a treaty. So a treaty isn't a granting of rights to a tribe from the United States government. It's actually the other way around. Um, the Native American tribes gave rights to the U.S. government in exchange for living on reservations. As really oversimplified. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something to remember. It's a treaty is not, it wasn't given to white colonizers. It was, you know, we're gonna, and, and also treaties are about Native American tribes retaining rights. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Lummi Nation has the right to use water on its reservation and to access water uh, for its usual and accustomed um, fishing grounds, which was really uh, a key point in protecting Cherry Point from uh, the GPT coal terminal, is that was an impact to their usual and accustomed fishing rights. They have a right for that area to be protected for them to use. So speaking of which, salmon. Not to, not to like, keep talking about how bad things are, uh, but our salmon populations are declining. And that's, you know, salmon are what orcas eat and orcas are what people like to watch and um, it's all part of an ecosystem. But the other thing about salmon, to get back to treaty rights, is it's not just important to the Lummi Nation and the Nooksack Indian tribe that there be salmon, it's, it's part of who they are. Salmon is who they are. So when salmon are in decline, it's it's really a cultural hit. Um, so we have basically to honor the treaties that the United States government has with these nations. It, it we are part of managing bringing back salmon. That is part of those treaties as well. So in terms of water quantity, we've got this line of people who have rights to water. Nobody owns water. Um, well. That's not true. In this water right system, nobody owns water. You have the right to use certain amounts of it. Um, and as, yeah, I won't even talk about corporations buying water rights, like Nestle, let's not go there. <laughs> it's a whole different forum, but, um, but water is a big issue. I mean, every, every 
thing lately that's come up has, you know, you can draw it back to water. We've got uh, Cape Town, South Africa is about to run out of water mm -hmm. completely. No more groundwater. So, and you can imagine the kind of conflicts and the kind of issues that that brings up. Here in Whatcom County, we have a lot of water, but we do have a problem. Is August and September, which are two of my favorite months in the Northwest, <laughs> because they're nice and dry and sunny. Those are times when the most people need the most water and we have the least amount of water available. Um, which again gets back to salmon. Salmon also need a lot of water at those times of year. They need it in the little small creeks and tributaries that run into the Nooksack River so that they can uh, you know, grow bigger and lay eggs and do all the cool things that salmon do. And those are the times when we have the least amount of water. Those are also the times when we need uh, water for irrigation. So water use spikes up for that. It's also the time when people want to water their lawns and, and all that. So we have a water problem in general throughout the year, but we have a really big water problem in those few months. So uh, what resources does is we try to use policy and advocacy and science. So we love folks like Wayne because then we don't have to know all that stuff. We can just call him up and ask him. Um, we try to use science, education, advocacy, changes in policy to uh, make our water resource management more fair. Uh, and gosh, I mean, I could just go on and on. I have a whole list of things um, I want to say, but I do want to leave time for questions. Uh, suffice to say, I work at an environmental nonprofit, and this is a challenging time uh, to work in anything related to the environment or social justice. And I think that the way that we move forward with this is to engage our community in making change and also in, in as, an environment, as a white environmentalist working for a nonprofit that works on the environment, I can acknowledge that we have really siloed out our movement. And we've left out one of the most important things when moving forward, and that's intersecting the environment with social justice and with other uh, movements. And in order to create a system where we're being more fair with how we allocate water and where we're engaging people in insisting that our governments uh, make changes needed to make our systems of managing water and protecting water and stopping pollution more fair, we've got to do a better job at that. And that's part of the reason why I'm here today, part of the reason why I'm going to sit down <laughs> in a second um, and, and look forward to hearing your questions. So, just totally went off script on everything I wrote down that I was going to say, but uh, I'm just going to sit down and let other people talk. While she's getting that heat up, I'll say that it's good to hear from Wayne and Ramon. And I go to a lot of, as a farmer, I go to a lot of farm conferences. I go to going one for Friday, Friday or tomorrow on Saturday this week. And we don't hear, farmers don't hear enough from people like Ramon and Wayne. Um, they tend to hear, like when, when you go to a farm conference and they talk about labor, they talk about a labor problem. That's how it's always framed as a labor problem. <laughs> when they talk about pesticides, they only think about one recipient of that pesticide, whether it's the pest. It's an insect, the effects on an insect, effect on a fungus or a bacteria um, or weed. It's never the effects on the system. Um, and that dialogue doesn't happen and it needs to happen. It's good that it's happening here, but it also needs to happen in those big rooms where farmers are, the big farmers are. Anyway, I'm going to give you a seven year history of like seven minutes of Bohemian blueberries. Um, we'll leave time for questions later. Um, um, my wife and I took over Bow Hill Blueberries, um, which was originally called Anderson Blueberry Farm. It's in the very north end of the Skagit, we feel like we're south block. Uh, it's the oldest blueberry farm in the Skagit Valley, and it's tiny by today's standards. It's a little over five acres of blueberries. 
Um, most farms now, if you start with a farm, you're planting 40, 80, 120 acres of blueberries. Um, we purchased it from the Andersons. Our plants are 71 years old this year. Um, they're heirloom varieties that you um, really can't find in a lot of places. Um, we um, took it over, took it organic the first day. Um, that's the only way we would do things. Um, we, our house is in the middle of the field, and everybody that works at the farm works in those, those fields, and so we, don't, we wouldn't do it any other way, really. Never even considered it. Um, we talk about watersheds. Um, right now, we are the watershed, because you know, this is the, what used to be the North Fork of the Samish River. So we feel like we're in the Samish watershed. We're not really in the Skagit watershed. Um, there will probably be catastrophic events later that will make us the Skagit. They'll take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> that will be in the Skagit watershed. But we can't expand. We have water there. Um, right now, our field, like most of the winter, is half underwater, but our varieties are fine with it. They're the original bog plants from the East Coast, from New Jersey. And they don't, you know, modern plants would die in that kind of situation. Um, we have, you can see, we live in the middle of the field in our house. Um, the big gift that we got from the Andersons was that we have a processing facility which created the sustainability that we were able to do in Bow Hill Blueberries by having a place to process and control our fruit. Um, that's Ann and Severin Anderson, so they originally moved to the, uh, that farm in the 30s. They grew strawberries up until 1947, right after World War II, they, they brought in the blueberries. He also grew golden seed seal and raised mink. Um, this is, that's the family as it is now. Um, my son who works a lot of farmers markets, my wife does marketing and sales. It's me, I farm, and then I also do our value added production, our food safety, um, and handle production. And our daughter does our design work, our logos, our um, packaging. Um, again, that's a processing building that was left behind by the Andersons. They used to pack for fresh and frozen. Um, and, it, you know, for many, many years, for the 65 years they had it, they sustained a family business on six acres of fruit doing fresh and frozen. Um, that's not really possible anymore. The prices are dropped. Um, they passed away. The kids didn't want to do it anymore, and that's how we ended up with it. Um, our mission statement, or our mission statement in 2011, it's to rejuvenate the farm to the vibrant, community-oriented, sustainable farm it once was while transitioning the 65-year-old conventional farm to certified organic. And one of the other gifts the Anderson left us is heirloom fruit. Uh, one of the varieties we have is rubles, which is now a variety that's been around for 102 years. Those original plants in New Jersey are 102 years old and still alive. It's a very small fruit, uh, very hard to pick, not useful. Uh, we had a Originally, we were trying to sell fruit our first couple of years. We had one of the big farms in Skagit come and look at our fields and say, you have a lot of obsolete fruit. And uh, so we consider that heirloom, you know, heirlooms. <laughs> Proud of. Um, but rules are the highest antioxidant. Um, and we just found stuff for it to do. You can see that's our son. You know, we have big fruit, we have little fruit. Um, part of the conversion organic, uh, we have really low soil organic matter. We have very high pH. We took over the soil. They were using cheap fertilizers for 65 years, and our pH was 3.9. and pretty much burn your finger if you put it in there. The first thing we do is bring in a lot of compost. We put in 100 cubic yards of compost per acre per year, and we're still continuing that. Um, so we've mounted up the plants, and we're doing lots of improvement on the plants. For our first five years, our production increased 50% a year. Doing different things, really putting some micronutrients back in the soil because typically in conventional agriculture, you're putting nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, but there's all kinds of limiting things that were originally in our soils that we've eaten and we've harvested and hauled away and cut hay and removed. <coughs> um, and if you're just putting back a few of them, you're leaving out a lot of other things. So we put in a lot of kelp, we put a lot of volcanic minerals, like uh, azomite. Um, I think later we're going to talk about pricing and how food is priced in sustainable food. Um, when we come in our store now, we have a little sign up that tells people pretty much why things cost more, both the blueberries, what it means to be organic, the cost of hand labor, the cost of um, uh, the compost, the kind of things that go into it. Um, the thing that makes it work, this is this warehouse where the Anderson used to just pack machine picked fruit. Um, we created a commercial kitchen, so we make all the products that we make are made in our kitchen right here, except the ice creams made by Lopez and Creamery. Um, and so that was sort of the ticket from taking us from not making to making. 
And a really good test case of what we're doing is um, we're six acres. Adjacent to us, there's three other five to six acre farms. And in the last seven years, they've either quit, torn out their plants, um, or just not harvested. There's one of them that has not even picked a berry in two years. Um, they didn't do organic, they didn't do any value added production, and um, found that the big processors cut them off, they were selling processed fruit. And if you're small now, there's so much fruit coming out of Western Washington into limited processing. If you're not organic or you're small, you kind of get squeezed out. Um, we started off, we did a lot of U-Pick early on before we started doing the value added products. That's a fairly uh, good way to sustain. It's a lot of work, it's not guaranteed, um, but it's one of the aspects. We still do about 20% of our fruit is U-Pick. And we want the fields open, we have organic fruit, we tell people to eat it off the bush. We started this thing called a grazing pass, so for $5, it looks like a backstage pass, and you get to eat all you want. So it's an all-you-can-eat uh, organic blueberry buffet. You can look at Mount Baker and, and eat to your heart's delight, and you only pay for what you take home. Do it. Um, because it does help cover some of the costs. If you come and only, we're going to pick a pound of fruit, um, then we're kind of losing money on that thing. So it helps cover it. If you pick 10 pounds or more and pay for it as you pick, you get your five dollars back for your grazing pounds. So we started off. We did a lot of fresh fruit, um, and then we found out really there's so much fruit now. Everybody's got fresh fruit at the same time. It's kind of hard to make any money doing that. You're competing against a lot of big farms. A lot of big farms that now have machine picking for fresh fruit. Um, it's not. It's not really a keep, way to keep doing it. So the first transition we did to value added was we started freezing fruit. And then, so we now freeze a significant most of our crop, and that takes us out of that busy time in two months when everybody has fresh fruit. Um, kind of what's going on now is that you have fresh fruit 12 months of the year because a lot of it's coming from Chile. If you go pick up your blueberries now at the co-op or at Safeway or anywhere, they're gonna be from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but we do a lot of frozen, um, and we still do a certain percentage of it. Uh, one of our we sell uh, the frozen blueberries for the smoothie bar at, a, at one of the prominent professional football teams in Seattle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the only one? <laughs> yeah. um, this is our line of products as it is now. So we value add most of our fruit. So we're now even a net buyer of fruit. So there's three other farms, four other farms that we found that still have heirloom varieties that we want. that are part of our branding and part of our flavor. Um, that are organic. We're losing some of those. There's more and more farms in Whatcom County. Last year I looked at Craigslist over the winter and there were a lot of five and ten acre blueberry farms that had Jersey and Rubles and these heirloom varieties that are for sale, they're quitting, they're selling their plants. Um, but we do a juice, that's our main product now. Um, it's, we're the only in the country that's a cold pressed organic heirloom in a glass bottle juice with no apple juice, water juice, grape juice. It's just the small bottle has 547 berries in it. We do a powder from the pulp. Once the pulp is pressed and get the juice out of it, we make a powder, we dry it, and put it in a hammer mill, make a powder, and we're also looking at doing a, uh, moving forward, doing a vinegar, a fermented vinegar from the pulp. Um, we do a marinade, dried blueberries without any added sugar. We do a pickled blueberry out of those little tiny rubles. Um, and that's become sort of our signature thing. We ship those around the country, they're popular. Um, with, they're really good with salmon. Um, and then we do a sauce and jam. That's the pickled little rubles on uh, salmon. Um, we co-brand a few things. Lopez on Creamery has a Bohill blueberry branded ice cream you'll see at Hagen and Co-ops. Um, and that uses the Jersey fruit. Some of the heirloom fruit, when you blend it, like for a smoothie or ice cream, it stays purple, and they don't have to add blue food coloring. So if, you, if you blend modern fruit, like you see at the store, you know, it comes out kind of brownish red. It's not so attractive. Um, and everything we do is kind of small scale. Um, this is a little small uh, juice press we got from Slovenia. That's how we press. It takes 180 pounds. It takes like an hour and a half. Press it 180 pounds. It's kind of slow, but it's, it's scale appropriate. Um, and then we bought a little flash. When you do juice nowadays, you have to, after the odd walleye E. coli thing that happened a couple of decades ago, <coughs> mm -hmm. everything has to be pasteurized. Um, so we bought a little flash pasteurizer from Austria, which is also a small tabletop setup, and it heats it up really fast, fills the bottle to a level. Um, and 
uh, it's something we can afford at our scale. It's, most of the stuff made in America is like hundred thousand dollars. It's designed for large factories. It's not designed for small farm on farm processing. Um, we dehydrate blueberries. We're one of the only ones out there that doesn't have sugar and oils in them because most fruit they infuse with sugar, so half the weight sugar. Sugar is cheaper than blueberry. Um, and modern fruit, if you dry, it's kind of tart. The old varieties of sugar have sugars in them that you don't need to add to it. But we do all that on farm. We have a little store um, that the Andersons had, and we just sort of took it over. And so we're open seven days a week year round um, because we're in the back making stuff. We don't really staff it when it's not the summer. But we come up when we don't people, and they can buy their juice, frozen food. Um, this is one of the things about costs. So one of the things we had to, when we went from when we started our UPIC when we were organic, we went to two dollars and seventy-five cents a pound. And everybody always remembers, I used to pick for a dollar pound. They always go, oh, we used to, the Andersons never would have charged that much. So I went and bought <laughs> a couple of Twinkies at the local uh, convenience store, weighed them, priced them out. They're $10.49 a pound plus tax, which is four times what our you pick fruit costs, where you can pick it and organic yeah, fruit off. You know, so, <laughs> so what's, you know, when you're talking about the value of the price of food, you never would think a Twinkie's an expensive item. But you think our 275 pound blueberries are very expensive, right? Um, but we put this up and nobody gets it. They come in and they ask, do you have Twinkies? <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot of direct marketing. This is our farmer's market booth, which we sometimes are in Bellingham. We do a couple little farmers now. Um, we do a lot online. We ship um, anywhere it goes in the country. The juice, everything but fresh and frozen. And we're trying to develop that to help us have some good year-round markets for all our products. We do a lot on the Puget Sound Food Hub. That's um, used to be this is the old T-shirt. Used to be a collective. Now it's a cooperative, farmers' co own cooperative, and that's our dis main wholesale distribution from pretty much Blaine to the south part of King County, um, and it's pretty successful. The majority of the produce, the dollar volume that goes on the Puget Sound Food Hub, is from Whatcom County. Um, with Skag the rest of it coming from the Skagit County. Um, and it's very effective. We have three trucks go all over the place. They deliver the co-ops in Bellingham, deliver all of our restaurants, um, all the Amazon cafes, 13 of the Amazon locations, Microsoft. We also sell a little bit to Charlie's, a big producer. Um, we're in local stores. We have these in the co-op. These are in some Hagen's. Um, we designed our, in order to get space in the grocery store, which is really hard to get, we created our own space. So we built our own little, we had some artisans in Edison make six of these little stands with a paper mache blueberry, and we, they get really prominent display in the grocery stores, and the grocery stores are asking for them now, and we just tell them, you can have them, but you got to stock, you know, the full list of stuff. Um, that's a little juice kit that we shipped, uh, kind of as a gift. Um, we work with a lot of restaurants and bars who've come up with like various drink recipes, come with our drinks, we have this list of cocktails and mocktails. That's a, um, a blueberry martini with the pickle blueberries floating on a little basil boat in one of the restaurants. Oh, cool. So here's kind of our, I'll end with a little bit of our revamp mission statement um, now that we know more about what we're doing every seven years. To sustainably farm the oldest blueberry farm in the Skagit Valley through organic and innovative practices, offering unique high-quality blueberry products, and continuing to create harvest memories and deep connections to farm fresh food for our community. That's it. And then the other prompting question was, what can the community do to support your role? One thing I think that um, Go Hill does really well, just looking at that, is imparting some of the passion, I feel. Like I'm sitting here listening to everybody talk, and I'm like, yeah, and this is so important, and this is what you can do, but how do you turn that into something that um, the community can engage with, and it doesn't feel like 
it produces a guilt trip and makes people go away. So, you know, your Twinkie reference for me is like so dead on. What is the cost of the food that you're buying and what goes into the food that you're buying? And that's a question um, that as a grocery store, we ask a lot. Um, especially when we're thinking of how do we communicate that and how do we compete with the corporate and capitalistic marketplace that we're in that drives things based on how cheap and easy can you get it and we're kind of playing with that balance. So, what is our role in the food system? At the most basic level, we are a grocery store. And we're a cooperatively run grocery store that was started by community members for eight items. I think initially when it started, it was that, for, I, you know, having talked to one of the people that founded it, she was like, I just didn't have enough money and we needed to buy things in bulk and work together. So they actually went down to PCC and asked them to buy bulk items and brought up, you know, eight, eight items. So it's changed a little bit. We're about to be 50, things have changed. Um, but every day we're a grocery store. So the other part about being a cooperative is that we get to have um, this other side, the what, what gets hidden behind the side and shows up in the products we carry, which is that we um, have a social responsibility that is driven by the money and what goes into the co-op. And so typically, a lot of what comes into the co-op is more like, how do we give it back out? What kind of initiatives do we push so that we can understand what we should be as a business and how how that shows up and it shows up in a lot of ways so um, I wanted to I'll just kind of break down so there's the grocery store and on the water raspberries and the food that we eat in the grocery store I was also making note of I'd done a presentation a bit ago and 70 what I understand is that 75 percent of the nation's raspberries are grown in Whatcom County. So it's a, we are a huge, huge grower of raspberries. The other thing to point out though is since we're growing the nation's raspberries in Whatcom County, um, we're also utilizing the water during that peak growing season to grow the nation's raspberries. And all, um, the majority of those raspberries are not organic by any stretch of the imagination. So we're also harvesting a product that has long-term toxicology impacts that we don't know. So I'll just kind of put that out as context that, so the co-op and when we look at the food that we carry, um, those are the kinds of things that we're trying to pull out, but then how does that show up on the shelf? Um, so first and foremost, the grocery store model. About 18 years ago, we started the Farm Fund, and we have this committee called the Member Affairs Committee. Part of being a co-op is it's democratically run, and members, it may seem like a large business, but members show up every month. I, have, I see a couple people that are on back, um, and we think about what it is to be an owner and what the look of the business is, and we get feedback and we work on initiatives. One of the things our member affairs committee came up with 18 years ago at this point is the farm fund. And the farm fund initially started as a micro grant program just to help build shared practices around sustainable farming. And that was basically like, people can't take a risk to try an heirloom variety of a fruit or a new variety of a strawberry to see if it will work in our climate and take less water. So the farm fund wanted to put funds towards that so we can have some learning for our farmers. In that time, it's evolved. And we started hearing more and more, we know land is an issue in Whatcom County and having access to land for farmers. Um, and that scaling up was the other thing we were hearing from farmers is, I'd like to go from being a CSA or a farmer's market, but how do you even make that jump from being a small, maybe one to two acre farmer um, to being somebody that can sell to a grocery store and earn a living. So the Farm Fund now is doing microloans and um, partnered with the credit union and the, so the co-op secures the funds for that farmer and then builds that relationship with the credit union for the farmer. Um, and then we match it with grants. So that's kind of learning and evolving and trying to hear what the farmers need from us while also realizing that people are in a pinch and we are losing farmland. And we do have blueberry farmers. I look at those same Craigslist ads and think, should I be a farmer? <laughs> but 
Um, but it's the reality that's happening for more and more people, and we hear it, and I hear it across, I hear it even with the larger ag farmers too, that they're feeling that. I think we see that in some of the um, political stuff that's happening, or you know, the news, the news features that are going out as people feeling threatened as farmers on all those sides. Um, so, so we've got the farm fund. The other part is that recently, well, five years ago, we went through a process to, to build a strategic plan. So we reached out to the community, to our shoppers, to our staff to figure out what should the priorities of the co-op be. And one of the main things that we did get back is that we should be focusing on local food system development. So that is one of our goals. But what that means is a whole thing to start untangling and how that shows up. Um, when I, I started around the time that the strategic plan came into being, and um, what came about from that was, one, a commitment to doing sustainability reporting and having a third party monitor goals and metrics that we do to hold ourselves accountable as a business. So um, we have a sustainability coordinator. She sets the goals. I, we have a little tiny report that we put out, but I put the larger um, pamphlet or binder over there that shows what the goals are for the year, how we met them, how we didn't meet them, and what's happened over the year. So we send that away to a third party, the Sustainable Food Trade Association, and they monitor us. They monitor the goals we set and tell us if we set reasonable goals or not, and then they look at the report and let us know if we're full of holes and what we need to do from there. Um, the other thing that came out of the strategic plan was partnering with other organizations on what is called the Wacom Food Network. Has anybody here heard about the Wacom Food Network? Awesome. Oh, that's so heartening to hear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I say that because I've had a lot of conversations lately where I'm talking about the Wacom Food Network and how to give it more... Um, more of a foundation to stand on so it continues to grow. And one of the things I've been hearing back from funders is that they don't believe in foods, they don't believe in system change. But the Wacom Food Network is based on the fact that we have a food system and we have some control and we can change it as long as we're informed and working together. So, so it's heartening to hear that you've heard about it. And I will say that the co-op and myself basically come with the, with the belief that you can make system change. And so this is one path, is starting to get the information so that the reality of where we're at right now is available for one, everybody to have and to see. It's available to present for decision makers and then you bring in more voices. So you have um, something I was sharing with people the other day from my perspective from the co-op is, I think I used to think the co-op's a grocery store we care about organics. People might say, like, you care about food, you care about organics, so we care a lot about that. Then we also care about farmers because we need farmers and farms to make food, and then, oh yeah, we care about fair trade and we care about the people who are picking the food, but it just seemed like our primary care was organics. When you look at a food system and you're actually giving equal value and weight to each of those categories, you are seeing the fact that you, have, you don't have food, you don't have farmers if we don't have labor. You don't have farms if we don't have water. So there's kind of a, what I've been calling, for lack of a better word right now, is the paradigm shift of seeing that it's much more connected than just kind of a sphere, what's my sphere of influence on these areas? It's more, <coughs> these are directly re related, correlated to our well-being as a business and a community. Yes. What is the mission or purpose of the Wacom Food Network? Well, at the basic level, it's to foster collaboration and partnerships within the food system. At our most basic level, we host forums to share information, because what we were finding was, we'd, this is the perfect example of a food network meeting. You'd have everybody who goes together for a meeting about water, and you see those people repeatedly at your meetings. So they're your, you know, your realm of knowledge. But then I'd go to another meeting for people working on, I don't know, pick a topic. It's like you pick it with um, farming and I'd have a different group of people. And there's these two groups working on a system 
that impacts its, you know, they impact each other with their work, but we're having two separate conversations. So that is, at the base level, that's what the Food Network is trying to do. One of the things that we put out to forward this beyond getting together twice a year to share information across sectors is the community food assessment. So the community food assessment so far has come out three every three years. That is the commitment we've done. Initially, WSU Extension paid to do a full assessment. So it's like, what is the state of farmland? How much do we have currently? What is the state of water? Where are we looking at with shellfish beds? How many are closed? How many are open? You know, and doing key stakeholder interviews and data. So we just get all the data broken into the sectors down for a report. You can find these online. Um, and then every three years we go back and we check in. And we also ask, so who else do we need to be asking? <laughs> like who else isn't at the table? I know when you were talking about treaty rights, I'm like, so we're gonna need to put them on the interview list yeah. for sure. Um, but this provides a baseline conversation. So when I'm looking at food system as the co-op, which is also this hat that comes on every once in a while, I take this information and for the Food Network, we used it when the comp plan came up at Whatcom County and said, here, here's our data, this is what we're seeing, and we think you need to acknowledge that we have a local food system, and that it is a value. It's an economic value to Whatcom County to acknowledge what it is. That's all we're asking, just acknowledge that right there. And that, that means that in the next you know, work of the comp plan, we're gonna have to address how we're going to maintain that economic value. So um, we use this, that's what the Food Network kind of does in their work is get a baseline understanding, try to bring the stakeholders to the table, find shared perspectives. Um, Who funds it? <laughs> a lot of hard work. Right now we've had the Sustainable Welcome Fund has provided some support for um, a 10 hour a week admin person, but mostly it's donated by the organizations that show up. Uh, and it is open, they're open meetings, so it, it is open. Uh, I know resources sits on our, our steering committee at this point. Okay, so I'll just, uh, <laughs> it's a passionate thing. So I'll say the creation of the Food Network and CFA is how we show up in the food system, and I would encourage you to check this out if you want to understand what's happening currently. What you can do, I'm just going to say one more thing before the hook comes out. Um, <laughs> When I thought about what can you do, I had a lesson uh, about two years ago, maybe three years ago at this point, which is we've had a change in which we realize we can impact the food system. When um, Ramon and other farm workers came to the co-op and asked us to have a boycott, I think the initial reaction is, we can't impact that. We're not gonna make a difference if we boycott. Um, and that wasn't the case, and I think it was a moment where the cop went, whoa, we can actually um, change the dialogue and we can help somebody else change the dialogue that's happening. So we understand we can make an impact, and I turn it back to you, that you can make an impact, you just show up, show up at Mac, show up at the Food Network, show up in your purchasing, and uh, that's, my, that's my statement. <laughs> Rearranged questions, but I thought that due to the timing that we would have the audience ask questions that they might be interested in. So I will take the mic and Anna will facilitate. Yes. And um, so raise your hand if you have a question. Um, and if you'd like to pass, if you have a written question and you, you don't want to present it to everyone, you can um, pass it forward. Um, and we've got one right now. Um, for Boho blueberries. How many farm workers do you hire, and how do you recruit them? So, any mic? Um, yes, I've got a mic right here. Go ahead. So, um, so we have two places to work. We work in a, at Boho blueberries. We have store staff and we have warehouse staff. But if you're talking about field harvest crew, we work different than most people. We're small, and we have. Sure. Oh. I can just come up here. 
before we do this. I, we work a lot different than big farms. We don't have the challenges that a bigger farm. We work with a couple of families that are local families that have worked in the area that are professionals um, that know more about blueberries than I do. Um, and I, it's hard for me to talk about my um, the people that work with us in our field without crying about it because of the dedication they have and the management that they handle. Um, we probably could pick our five acres with six to ten people every day through from the beginning to the end. Um, and the way we work is we do not dictate a price, um, unlike larger farms. We work together on a price that's paid. Um, we have a $12 an hour minimum floor, um, but harvesters can get $27, $30, $32 an hour that are good at our farm. Um, like when you hire a plumber, you don't know, say, fix this pipe for so much. The plumber is a professional, they fix your pipe and they tell you what it costs to, to fix the pipe. And that's how, that's the philosophy we use with harvesting. Um, so we don't dictate a price, we work on a price together, or if we're told a price, that's the, you know, we let the, the harvest crew be the price makers, not the price takers. Just like we want to be as farmers when we're selling our fruit, we want to be price makers, not price takers. Um, so that's pretty much how it works. We uh, hire a stable crew of, it's a couple of families. They've lived in Burlington area or in the Skagit Valley for 20 plus years. Um, when you come to pick at our place, you work, you get to work from the first day to the last day we harvest. If it's raining, you don't, have to go home, we'll do something else. We work in the warehouse packing fruit or we weed. So um, everybody knows they're gonna have a job from the first day to harvest to the last. And if you stay till the very end of harvest, when we're done, when it's kind of starting to get slow, um, then you get a bonus paid all the way back to your very first pound. So that's to encourage people to stay. Because our first year we would lose um, harvest crew if when other, like maybe more lucrative things happen, like blackberries pay really well, so it's hard to lose. So now we have a commitment to the crew for the entire summer, and they have a commitment to us. The other thing we do is that the harvest crew, we have um, manages what rows and where they're picking and at what and how the field is harvested in terms of, um, they're in the field a lot more than I am now, and so they have a feel of how the flow is and how, um, you let an area rest and you come back and sort of maximize how many pounds they're going to get and get paid. They maximize it because they know they're from there from the beginning to the end. So they want to maximize the harvest, which works great for both of us. They maximize how many pounds they're paid for and, they, and we maximize how many pounds we get. So it's a cooperative um, effort that we, that we do in our field. So that's it. We, you know, sick, you know, but again, we, we don't have, and we don't have a big brand new machine running is our leverage. <laughs> so um, we, just, we work together. Oh. Yeah, I don't need a mic. This is for Adrian. Uh, when you said that you've talked to people who say, I don't believe in change, system change. And I'm trying to think what that system change might be. And I'm thinking bad trickle butts. Nixon's Secretary of Agriculture, whose mantra was, get bigger, get out. And so that seems to me like the system that we had in this country, probably since the Civil War, people have gotten bigger and farms have gotten bigger and there have been fewer and fewer farmers per acre, and, and that's our system. So what alternative is there for people's belief in, in, in this way? If I don't believe in system change, what, you know, what, what am I thinking about? I don't, that's, if you don't believe in system change, what do you think about That was my question back to them. Yeah. Uh, I think what I heard back, because it was a conversation, um, was I, you can just, it's band-aiding the problem, like if we're looking at hunger, that we can't change the issue of the <coughs> hunger that we're having. And, the, um, and so it was more like, I just need to make sure, they need, you know, somebody would just need to make sure that they're providing food to all the locations where people are hungry. Or if you look at our homeless situation, so the answer, I'm not sure because I can't see beyond the fact that I think that we can interrupt systems. Um, and, but I do think that it's hard, you know, I think it's hard work and I think it takes having people at the table and operating in good faith 
and working with some trust and building that, and then you gotta you gotta have the conversations, which is the challenge. Um, so this is a question for Anne. Um, pardon me if I get one or two of the words wrong, but I think but I think I have the gists. So other parts of the country uh, use reservoirs to retain water. Um, they have such an excess rain um, during some months, uh, which retained um, can be used for irrigation, leaving enough in the streams uh, for the salmon. Why not here? California? No. <laughs> That's a really good question. So, uh, you know, I would start answering that question with backing up to do we really want to use that sort of system before we address the reason that we're in the situation we're in? So, um, Eleanor Hines, our lead scientist who was a student of Wayne's, um, likes to say, I don't, I want to make sure we're not creating another problem um, by trying to fix a problem. So storage, off-channel storage, it's sometimes called, is, is a, a good idea, um, but I don't want to jump all the way to that um, yet. Like I said, our challenges are, and, and our challenges will get increasingly worse, it's true, with climate change. And so that might be a place that we end up. But our challenge right now is that we don't have enough water when we need it most, which is, um, you know, two to three months a year is, is when the peak of that problem hits. Uh, and, and there's a lot of reasons that is. One is climate change. One is we don't know how much water we're using. Um, a lot of our irrigation wells don't have meters on them. A lot of our uh, wells, rural wells, outside of like the city of Bellingham and the city also don't have meters on them. And we don't actually even have, and we're in the process of, finding out how much water we have. So we're not, we don't have really good data on how much water we use. We don't have really good data yet on how much water we have. So before, I think that before we start talking about you know, these manufactured solutions um, that we look at the ecosystem as a whole and how, you know, how ecosystems function with water. Every drop of water that drops from the sky, you know, ends up in the water system, the water cycle that we all learned when we were kids. The rain comes down and some evaporates into the clouds and comes back down and rains. Some of it soaks in and goes to the groundwater and eventually out. So how can we create Net, or replicate more natural systems um, to handle water than these manufactured reservoirs and things like that. So I think it's not a bad idea of storage, but um, but you know I, I don't want to jump all the way to that yet before we have a good handle. I think we have a lot of great minds in this county and in the state, and uh, if we sit down at tables and talk to each other and work together, um, we I think we can do better than that. Um, and we might end up there, you know, 20 years down the road, but, um, and the, you know, the other thing about water quantity is, um, you know, everything's connected. So how we choose to engage in our local food system and how we make choices about who we buy food from and uh, who we support, that makes a difference in water quantity. So no, diversified crops, use less water than, than larger kind of um, monocrops. Uh, we need to look at our water laws. Uh, right now, well, as of Friday, um, a, a rural domestic well in the county can use up to 5,000 gallons a day. Uh, that's a lot of water. Uh, you know, is that really necessary? So just looking at all these little pieces and connecting them all um, before we jump to manufacturing solutions, I think is a better way to go and better for the food system. Um, anyone with a point on the way? I just wanted to ask Ramon if there is anything specific that the general community can do to support the work that you're doing with the farm workers and the union. Bueno, este año 
Bueno, primeramente me gustaría darle un aplauso al Señor otra vez. Uh, I wanted to give an round of applause to the, the uh, gentleman at the end. Uh, it was the first time I've heard somebody talk like that and he convinced me. It's a, a way of, of saying or thinking that things are possible, that yes we can. This is an example of a, a small farm. It, it, has, it can sustain the six acres and it can sustain the business. And organic. Without uh, the need or having to uh, uh, and poison our workers. So there's no excuse for a big farm with more resources, more money to not do the same as they're doing. So I want to thank them for uh, explaining a little bit. And I'm understanding a little bit about the system. So it's interesting to hear a farmer about how to protect us that he's worried and wants to look after the people. So thank you very much. Llegando a la pregunta. So, to the question. <laughs> este, bueno, va a haber muchas oportunidades. So, there will be very, a lot of opportunities. Este, para que la comunidad se envuelva este año. So, community, so the community can get involved. Yo creo que todos sabemos de que vamos a empezar a boicotear esta compañía de Sarbanán. You uh, probably heard that we're going to boycott Sarbanán. Vamos a tener un grupo de estudiantes. We're going to have a, a student group of uh, committees en el que vamos a darle duro. where we're going to hit them hard. Vamos a tener muchas acciones so there'll be lots of actions en las cuales ustedes van a estar invitados. where you'll be invited Yo creo que van a ser los principales. and you'll be the principal uh, actors in that. Los hermanos y hermanas de los sindicatos. The brothers and sisters from the union. Uh, Muchas gracias por apoyarnos. Thank you always for supporting us. Y gracias por ayudarnos a inspirarnos a seguir peleando. And for inspiring us to keep fighting. Para nosotros no ha sido fácil. It hasn't been easy for us. Este año va a ser un poquito más difícil. And it's going to be harder again. Vamos a, a pelear por un contrato sindical. So we're going to fight for a union contract. Por 600 trabajadores. For 600 workers. ¿Cómo no sabemos? How are we going to do it? We don't know yet. Eso es, vamos a esperar ayuda de la comunidad. That's why we're going to wait for the help of the community. Haciendo acciones. To keep doing actions. Y pues promulgando o accediendo a los beneficios o a los accesos que ocupamos como trabajadores domésticos. And to keep fighting for all the benefits and the, 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 the resources we need as uh, local workers. Y una, algo muy importante que se me olvidó, se me olvidó es... An important thing that I forgot to mention. Gracias por ayudarnos a proteger nuestros trabajadores. So thank you for helping protect our workers. Pero hay algo más que eso, nuestra dignidad. So there's something more than that, and it's our dignity. Este trabajo que yo he tomado por estos años me ha ayudado a entender un poquito más. So this job that I have taken on has uh, allowed me to understand more. Y pienso que a ustedes también. And I think also Como parte you. de la comunidad. Yo he recibido muchísima educación en estos tres años y medio. I've received a lot of education in the last three and a half years. Correr un sindicato de trabajadores de campo y documentados. So run a union that's a farm workers that are undocumented. Después de 30 años no es algo fácil. Uh, after uh, 30 years it's something not easy. Tenemos un pensamiento de cambiar. We have, we have a way of thinking that we need to change. Esperamos que este año sea otro cambio. This year will be another big change for our people. Y logremos otro contrato, contrato colectivo para nuestros hermanos también que vienen contratados bajo este programa. And we'll be able to achieve a contract for the, the workers, our brothers that are coming uh, under H2A program. Vamos a tener más comunicación sobre todas las acciones que vamos a planear. So we'll be giving out information about the planned actions. Creo que en estas semanas vamos a juntarnos todo grupo que trabajamos junto con comunidad, comunidad y el sindicato. So we're going to get together the, the group um, with the union and community to community. Y pensamos que lo más pronto que se pueda, como el mes que entra, vamos a empezar con las acciones. So hopefully by next month we're going to start with the actions. Y pues 
Gracias. So thank you. Y si sí se puede. Sí se puede. Se puede. Se puede. Se puede. Se puede. Se puede. I just wanted to ask Mr. Landis how often the agricultural industry seeks your uh, information and knowledge on the horrors of pesticides. That's easy. <laughs> so the uh, yeah, okay. agricultural industry does that. <laughs> and um, principally what we work through is uh, USC <laughs> and that's now done. E uh, I used to be on EPA panels and so forth, but I also get EPA money, so I'm no longer qualified. So it's been a big change in the last uh, 12 months. And even before then, it was very rare that we'd be asked. Part of that is that there are very specific rules and regulations, that's what they follow. Also the pest in the industry, you know, we talk a uh, small farm. You um, realize the pesticide industry is one of the largest in the world. Um, Things like atrazine are billion dollar a year profits. So, um, now they're not going to talk to me about this. Absolutely. Also, the rules and, and so forth that govern pesticide registration in this country is called the Federal Insecticide, Rodenticide, and uh, Fungicide Act, whatever. And that's a law that's actually used to be in the Department of Agriculture. And the law was originally written to demonstrate the efficacy of pesticides. And of uh, all the agencies at EPA, I would say it's been the one that changed the least since 1970. It's a very, uh, yeah, I should probably just stop there. <laughs> um, but that's, that's all really changed, uh, especially last year, but it's never been as to what we see for contaminated sites and um, the release of chemicals unwarranted into the environment. That's been a very different kind of activity and so forth than agricultural uh, chemicals. Very different activity. It's regulated under very different kinds of laws. So the answer is they don't. Yeah, and then I go to a lot of conferences. So I, if you go to an organic conference, they wouldn't have because they don't use the stuff, so they're not interested. But if you go to a conventional conference or a mixed conference, there is, again, no discussion of. Yeah. The effects yeah. of pesticides. It's, it, yeah. the, the presentations are strictly about this is what you use and this is when you spray it. No, uh, wait a minute. To kill this bug. One thing we weren't clear about yeah. I took the context as to mean the United States. It's very different in Europe. Very different sets of rules. Uh, some of the chemicals like atrazine, which are banned in Europe, are used extensively in the United States. Uh, the decision making process is very different. It's um, just like the agricultural industry in Europe is very different than it tends to be in the United States. So, when they ask me, I'm in Europe, not the United States. It's very different. And it also bothers me a little bit that organic farmers don't ask, because it's like their, their crops aren't exposed to pesticides. Of course they are. Uh, it goes down the water, goes through the air. Uh, herbicides sometimes can be transported uh, very long distances. Uh, but it's kind of, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And uh, the other thing is, I can't train my students fast enough, you know? We, we have a lot of people, like Eleanor, who actually work in, in the local community. I have students all over, all over North America, but we can only produce so many. And I think it's still, people have this huge reluctance to think about what's actually in environment. Anyone here ever read Silent Spring? Yeah. It's not an ecology book, it's a pesticide book, isn't it? It's a toxicology book. Yeah, and we're way beyond DDT as far as the new issues and so forth. So it's, it's a, these are interesting times and uh, the most interesting in my 40 year career. So um, that's a longer answer, but I think, I think you got the gist of it. I didn't know that the I wrote my question down, oh. and yes, I didn't realize that they were doing it this way. I appreciate that if you could read it or if I, I could read it. Um, is it not the one that we, the, about reservoirs? No. No? Okay. Not reservoirs. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. 
Yes, of course. Apologize. Um, what do you see as the route for hydroponic gardening um, and vertical farming in food uh, sovereignty and sustainability? That would be the role. The role. Um, anyone in particular? Or everybody? Should we just go down the line? Um, I've read a lot about the systems. Um, I still think we have a lot of soil out there that we should that we should be accessing. Um, that, that I mean, that's just my opinion. I've, I've read a lot of the vertical farming and um, and how it works, particularly in urban environments. And there's some really good projects in the city of Seattle where they're taking when there was more empty housing and turning them into internal uh, sort of um, grow growing operations for the neighborhood to work at and grow food out. Um, but then that kind of got wiped out by the high cost of rents and sales. It was a really, 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 really interesting model as opposed to the big vertical sort of tower of food. They're, they're one of the scary things, I think Amazon's investing heavily in one of these operations in the Kent area, which used to be real farms. Kent was a very big farming valley. So, um, uh, these systems tend not, I mean, a lot of them aren't organic and they don't, they're not really soil based. And so, I mean, in terms of nutrition and minerals and all the things that you can get in your food by growing in real organic soils, I'm a big proponent of that. And real sun. <laughs> I, um, I would just blend off. There was a movie that we'd hosted recently called The Evolution of Organics, and it was looking at how the organic movement came about, and how it's turned into kind of a, a money-making machine at this point for many corporations. It's the place to grow big now. Um, but one of the things they were looking at is that actually the soil quality of organic farms is showing to be a carbon, so quite like pulling out carbon, and so they were trying to tie it into the global warming and, and how to actually bring up our soils as a way of um, working on that issue as well. So there's another case to be made for just continuing in that. I think that can, I, that's a topic I just don't know enough about. I think there was also some um, regulation regarding organics that came up recently for hydroponic or what qualifies as organic and that it needs to kind of go through some type of vetting so that it doesn't get looped in by some corporation that sees it as an opportunity to buy into natural without actually having the regulation. Alex? Yeah, I, I had a thought. So, yeah. so um, you guys know what life cycle assessment is? Yeah. It's actually when you have a question like this and you actually go through, you start assessing all the inputs and the outputs. Well, I'd like to see some of that. Um, and you're going, why would you say it? I like math. You know, it's kind of like the kid who thought doing calculation was cool. I'm a pilot. We actually think math's really useful. Um, especially if you're burning so much fuel, you're going over the mountains and you really don't want to run out. All that kind of stuff's really useful. So when you do hydroponics as opposed to conventional farming, what is it like to do life cycle assessment of the nutrients, of the water, of the other kinds of energy that you're going to use. Uh, let's sit down and do the calculation. This is something I see a lot more happening in Europe. I think it's because the agriculture and the, the landscape is very different. I mean, you go to you take a train ride through Germany and there's farms everywhere. All these little farms, the land, the land's very differently used. Um, and that's where you see most of this kind of assessment. You see relatively little here. What I see with the, doing this with the energy, really opens your eyes. It's how, what do we do with our energy? What's lost in transmission? Um, let's think about the water. It's a life cycle assessment. If you put in um, a built reservoir, as opposed to using other kinds of water storage. And just like you were saying, we can't really make a plan until we have the numbers. So I'd like to see what the numbers are. And let's do the calculation. It might be great. Or it might have some trade-offs. And then it's a, it's a social decision. So often we're asked to make decisions without uh, information. Yeah. Or it might be complimentary. Absolutely, but we don't know that yet. So let's let's do the hard work. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know nothing about hydroponics, so I'm not gonna answer that. I mean, I know a little it's bit. Good but if you're going to Mars. Yeah. 
I don't plan to, but who knows. Uh, I'm going to come at this, Just it just occurred to me, I was thinking, I, I wanted to talk about protecting farmland, so I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to <laughs> stretch your question beyond what you meant. Um, but, uh, you know, part of having a quote-unquote sustainable food system is having land to grow food on, and part of having land to grow food on is protecting that land and its, and its affordability, which is a whole other um, uh, conversation. And, and we do that, and part of the way we do that is to have dense urban areas, um, have people living close to services um, in dense urban areas. The, the kicker with that is um, access to food, which is also part of a, a local sustainable food system, is, is people need access to food. Um, and people need to live in places that they want to live in. They, you know, we've got to make cities also desirable. Desirable, affordable, and dense. Um, but they also need to act a little bit, if we can, like natural systems. So we need things like rain gardens, and we need things like trees and forests, because those help clean that stormwater we're talking about. Um, so I think having places where people can grow food in dense cities, and as much as possible using some of that green infrastructure to be food, uh, can help. Uh, one, make our cities places people want to live, help uh, address access to uh, places to grow food by having community gardens, and sometimes, you know, we're space challenged because we're trying to cram a lot of people in a city, so things like vertical gardens, things like uh, community gardens, they, they build community, they bring people together, they increase access to food, um, and those sorts of things are, are things we need to be pressing when we're thinking about land use, when we're engaging our city councils uh, to make sure they're creating space where, where people can grow food and have access to food. So kind of stretch it out. Bueno, um, yo lo único que quería decir es que pues todos entendemos que todos estamos conscientes del cambio climático. So I think we're all aware of climate change. Y pues nosotros como trabajadores de campo nunca hemos experimentado tampoco esto. So us as farm workers we haven't tried Entonces, uh, many of these things. Pensamos que nosotros con lo que podemos a poquito aportar es tratando de trabajar directamente con la tierra. The thing, the way that we contribute is how we work directly with the land. Uh, y tratar de promover lo que es, es el trabajo orgánico. And to promote the, what is organic. Y, uh, este año pasado tuvimos la facilidad o de mirar qué es el proceso. Uh, we were able to see a, a little bit of that process last year. Y se nos hace muy interesante. Um, and it was interesting. Pero pienso que para eso todavía nos falta más capacidad. Um, and so I think we're still for us a lot of opportunities to learn are, are there. Será porque no todos hemos tenido la oportunidad de ver qué es el proceso. Uh, maybe because we haven't seen the opportunity to, say, to learn about hydroponics or uh, other ways. Pero uh, lo, volvemos atrás para el cambio climático. Queremos poner lo que sea de nuestra parte para seguir el proceso. But we want to put in our work uh, what's needed to, to address climate change. So I'm going to just read out the one, the last question. It says, how do we engage the restaurants and other food distribution organizations, such as food banks and school systems, in, in the food system discussion? Well, I guess we'll just have everybody... Oh, yeah, I mean, the food still in the school systems isn't what it should be. And actually, in Whatcom County, there's one of the strongest um, group of people who are working on that kind of those systems of getting food, good food in the schools. The Bellingham Food Bank, um, like as a Puget Sound Food Hub, um, I used to be one of the managers there, and I see what kind of things are, are sold. In the, the Bellingham Food Bank is one of the stars of buying local food, organic food, directly and paying prices that it's worth. It's not a donation system, they're, they're funded and they, they pay the going price. Um, they pay the same price that the, uh, the Bellingham co-ops 
uh, pay. They use the same pricing structure when they buy stuff from the Puget Sound Food Hub. So it's, up here, there's actually, it's, a, you're, it's, it's kind of a dream county for, and the model for how those things would be done because it's a real challenge in Skagit County, it's a real challenge in King County where we're also trying to do some of those things with our farm and with the Puget Sound Food Hub. And how would you engage the schools, food banks, um, okay, and other organizations in the food system change? Food system, yes. Well, um, I think a lot, a lot of them are, but I do think that I, I'm going to say something. Sometimes change, like you can, you can ask for change, and one of the things I found over time is sometimes you just wait a little bit until somebody retires. And then the door. <laughs> I'm not the <laughs> I ask, that's true. <laughs> and just to be clear in relation to that, I have nobody specific in mind. I'm just. <laughs> you do ask you later. Um, and so the things I've heard is that um, there, you know, there may be time for some fresh views, and that there may be doors opened later. I do know there are groups working on it, and tomorrow. Um, no, Monday I'll be meeting with the Farm to School Collaborative in which we're actually trying to work, so we've got the school district in Bellingham, and we're trying to pull in those partners and say, hey, this is how a collaborative works, we can have a share, we can work on developing some shared goals and starting to think about how are we going to do local procurement and then start trying to move those barriers and connect people. Um, and, and food banks, geez, I don't know, that for me just starts spinning into like, food access and, and issues of that nature. But I think it's we need some energy. We need some fresh faces on the front, too, that are pushing and, and asking and advocating in the county school districts for the stuff that's being demanded by Bellingham parents in some cases. And then we need to step up beside those parents and those activist groups in the counties and, and provide them the support that I think they get a lot of here. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I'm going to do the same thing I did with the last question. <laughs> um, uh, so our U.S. Uh, farm policy really emphasizes and rewards export um, of food. And that plays out very much in Whatcom County. So there's uh, the reason I bring that up is Someone mentioned earlier, oh, it was Adrian, you were talking about the, you know, the water we put on raspberries and the pesticides that we put on raspberries that our farm workers get exposed to. And then the raspberries leave here and we're left with you know, that water being gone and those health challenges. So, so much of, uh, of the issues that we have around agriculture in this community are externalized costs. So, you know, you have pesticides that run off of fields into waterways, or you have manure that runs off of fields into waterways, and, uh, and that the cost of dressing that pollution then leaves that farm um, and becomes a problem for our community. So, th all this is to say, <laughs> that uh, how, who we choose to engage, where we choose to buy our food from, the restaurants that we choose to go to um, are, you know, are our choices. And so I think part of the way we, we change this is, is to get educated as a community and to engage in policies and engage in um, all, all of these points where we can influence changes in our local food system and, and get more local control of our local food system. So, um, I mean, I think there's definitely a place for the larger farms in Whatcom County, but there's also a lot of room for more local food, which, in, you know, creates more of a local market, which, you know, um, <coughs> blah, 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 Ramon probably has much better things to say. No, me voy Pero sí tengo algo que decir. I have something to say. Este, nosotros estamos trabajando en un plan uh, que va a terminar chance de aquí en 10 años. So we're working on a plan and hopefully we'll be able to develop it within 10 years. Uh, 
El plan es formar una economía local. We want to form a, a local solidarity economy. En la formación de cooperativas. With uh, the formation of cooperatives. Tenemos varios planes y ya estamos uh, en unos entrenamientos. So we have lots of plans and we've already started some of the training. En la que creemos que muchas organizaciones van a caber en este cambio. And where we think a lot of organizations can fit into this change. Y yo pienso que muchos van a ser bancos de comida, restaurantes, todo lo que viene haciendo con frutas y verduras. A lot of it is, uh, you know, the food banks, the restaurants, uh, everything that has to do with fruits and vegetables. Chance ahorita no tenemos la capacidad para para carrear o o arrimar a las organizaciones para que nos apoyen. Maybe right now we don't we're not we don't have the capability to uh, get all the organizations. Es por eso que estamos haciéndolo bajo comunidad comunidad y familias unidas. That's why from familias unidas and community community working together. Ahorita pudimos demostrar que pudimos formar un sindicato. So we were able to prove that we were able to form unions. Ahora queremos probar de que sí hay otros caminos para otra economía local. And now we want to show that there's another way for a local economy. Y poder demostrar que sí podemos decidir cómo queremos trabajar. And where we can decide how we want to work. Y algo que estamos muy enfocados es de no tener patrones ni supervisores. And one of the things that we're working on is to not have bosses nor supervisors. Y el único camino que vemos son cooperativas. And the only way that we see is cooperatives. Entonces estamos en, insistiendo, ya llevamos año y medio más o menos planeando. So we have, uh, we're insisting, we already have a, a year and a half in the planning. El plan es muy largo, son 10 años. So it's a 10 year plan, it's long. No sabemos si vamos a vivir o morir. We don't know if we'll be alive Pero or cuando, dead. Cuando menos queremos seguir el camino. But we want to uh, follow this road de tener una oportunidad to have an opportunity. una oportunidad de mostrar que no se ocupa estudiar we want to show people that also you don't always have to study que no se ocupa tener dedicación that you, dedicación o que se ocupa, se ocupa tener dedicación that you, all you need is dedication y ganas and the will ganas de cambiar the will to change y pensamos que esta comunidad tiene algo muy importante oh, we think that this community has something very important y podemos desenvolverlo juntos. And we can develop that together. Lo único que ocupamos es apoyo. The only thing that we need is support. Apoyo para seguir trabajando juntos. The support to keep working together. Creo que es todo lo que voy a decir esta noche. And that's all I'll say tonight. Thank you. I want to thank you and I want to again thank all the presenters for all their time and information that they shared with us. And one last announcement is on February uh, 15th, we'll have an in-depth look at the H2A Guest Worker Program, and we invite you to attend. It's February 15th from 6 to 8 at the Bellingham Unitarian Fellowship. So thank you, and I'm glad you all were able to come. Good night. Este, se me olvidó, pero esto es muy importante. Tenemos un tribunal de trabajadores de campo el so día 5. I, I forgot to mention we have a farm workers tribunal on the 5th of February. 5 de febrero. Es muy importante que la comunidad de aquí vaya a apoyarnos. It's important that our community from here go support. Uh, vamos a tener muchos temas, lo que viene incluyendo este año lo que pasó en Sumas. So there'll be a lot of uh, issues, so including what happened in Sumas. El problema que tenemos muy grande con nuestra compañera Maru. And what's happening with Maru? Y también vamos a hablar un poco de cómo nos fue en el sindicato este año. And also to talk about how our first, uh, uh, how it went with our con union. Primer uh, contrato colectivo. Working under a union Pero contract. Pero esperamos que nos puedan ayudar y va a ser el 5. Tenemos la información en comunidad comunidad y familias unidas. Hopefully you can uh, uh, join us and there's information on familias unidas Facebook and. Olympia. CTC. And it's in Olympia. Va and I think there's flyers over here. Va a ser en Olympia, pues tenemos información. Y los esperamos verlos. And hopefully we'll see you. And one final note is, uh, if you have uh, further questions, pass them to the front, um, or give them to me or Michelle, and um, we'll make an effort to uh, ask people to answer them, and we'll put them on the Facebook page for this event. Thank you very much for coming.